Good morning and welcome to Silverside Online for Sunday, September the 27th. I believe it was shortly after her Senate confirmation to the Supreme Court that Judge Ginsburg said what you see on the screen here, and I'll read it. I'm a judge, born, raised, and proud of being a Jew. The demand for justice runs through the entirety of the Jewish tradition. I hope in my years on the bench of the Supreme Court of the United States, I will have the strength and the courage to remain constant in the service of that demand. Well, did she ever? Indeed, for a multiplicity of reasons, her Jewish heritage stirred her constantly to pursue justice. And part of that heritage was Hebrew scripture, properly interpreted, of course. Someone said that what you see on the screen here, not necessarily this particular image, but this verse hung in her chambers at the Supreme Court from the 16th chapter of Deuteronomy, a portion of that verse. Justice, justice shall you pursue. Inspired by Justice Ginsburg, we come to our twin concerns for today. And because of her and her exemplary way of leading, they are twin concerns, justice and dissent. Our literatures for today is Laura Englehart, and all of our readings today, all three of our readings today, are quotes from Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Here now is Laura with the first reading. A primary part of the history of our Constitution is the story of the extension of constitutional rights to people once ignored or excluded.
I'd like to make several general comments about dissent at this point, and then come back and refer to them and elaborate on them a bit as we move ahead this morning. Dissent is rooted in a concern for justice. Dissent, when it is verbalized, is uttered in the language of a minority. Dissent may be acted out rather than or in addition to being spoken. Dissent is not destructive. Dissent is often risky. Even in a democracy, there is often a price to be paid for dissenting. Thus, dissenters are typically courageous. Dissenters are true optimists. The prayer this morning is a version of the Lord's Prayer um, called the Lord's Prayer for Social Justice. It uh, has been written by Father Ron Rollheiser. Pray with Father Rollheiser's words with me, would you? Our Father, who always stands with the weak, the powerless, the poor, the abandoned, the sick, the aged, the very young, and those who, by victim of circumstances, bear the heat of the day, who art in heaven, where everything will be reversed, where the first will be last and the last will be first, but where all will be well and every manner of being will be well. Hallowed be thy name. May we always acknowledge your holiness, respecting that your ways are not our ways, your standards are not our standards. May the reverence we give your name Pull us out of the narcissism, selfishness, and paranoia that prevent us from seeing the pain of our neighbor. Your kingdom come. Help us to create a world where, beyond our own needs and hurts, we will do justice, love tenderly, and walk humbly with you and each other. Your will be done. Open our freedom to let you in so that the complete mutuality that characterizes your life might flow through our veins, and thus the life that we help generate may radiate your equal love for all and your special love for the poor. On earth as it is in heaven, may the work of our hands, the temples and structures we build in this world, Reflect the temple and the structure of your glory so that the joy, graciousness, tenderness, and justice of heaven will show forth within all of our structures on earth. Give life and love to us and help us to see always everything as gift. Help us to know that nothing comes to us by right and that we must give because we have been given to. Help us realize that we must give to the poor, not because they need it, but because our own health depends upon our giving to them. Us, the truly plural us, give not just to our own, but to everyone, including those who are very different than the narrow us. Give your gifts to all of us equally. This day, not tomorrow, 
do not let us push things off into some indefinite future so that we can continue to live justified lives in the face of injustice because we can use present philosophical, political, economic, logistic, and practical difficulties as excuses for inactivity. Our daily bread, so that each person in the world may have enough food, enough clean water, enough clean air, adequate health care, and sufficient access to education so as to have the sustenance for a healthy life. Teach us to give from our sustenance and not just from our surplus. And forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our blindness towards our neighbor, our obsessive self-preoccupation, our racism, our sexism, our incurable propensity to worry only about ourselves and our own. Forgive us our capacity to watch the evening news and do nothing about it. As we forgive those who trespass against us, help us to forgive those who victimize us. Help us to mellow out in spirit, not to grow bitter with age, to forgive the imperfect parents and systems that wounded, cursed, and even ignored us, and do not put us to the test. Do not judge us only by whether we have fed the hungry, given clothing to the naked, visited the sick, or tried to mend the systems that victimized the poor. Spare us this test, for none of us can stand before the gospel scrutiny Give us instead more days to mend our ways, our selfishness, and our systems. But deliver us from evil, that is, from the blindness that lets us continue to participate in anonymous systems within which we need not see who gets less as we get more. Amen. Dissents speak to a future age. It's not simply to say, my colleagues are wrong and I would do it this way. But the greatest dissents do become court opinions and gradually over time their views become the dominant view. So that's the dissenters hope that they are writing not for today, but for tomorrow. There are status quo types who believe and whoever is in control at a given moment are the people who can establish all the rules. And uh, that includes uh, determining what values will prevail in a community or a society or a nation. Uh, the people in power get to determine <clears throat> what justice is, not the Constitution, reinterpreted for the age in which we live, um, but what the power people want it to be, which um, in current political uh, trends means uh, preferential treatment for um, all the uh, members of the Trump family and their buddies, uh, even those who have done uh, blatantly illegal things. That's justice for, for apparently um, many of the political leaders in the nation right now. And they're on the bandwagon, smiling and grinning because they happen to be in control right now. And uh, Mitch McConnell is uh, the ringleader of the non-Trump uh, version of it, which is very much uh, akin to the Trump version of it, but uh, blocking Obama's Supreme Court nominee and leaving the Supreme Court one justice short for m many months was uh, what he did politically prior to Trump's election and trying to get a justice uh, pushed through uh, before this upcoming presidential election to sit in the seat vacated by 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg is now a matter of urgency. Uh, that is uh, what is passing for justice these days. Um, it is impossible to talk about justice without getting political in these times and maybe in all times. The Hebrew prophets in scripture, in Hebrew scripture, as we read about them, are constantly engaged in the political process. So when we try to talk about what is just in this society, because the political realm makes so many decisions that impact so many people, we cannot sit back and fail to comment about what is actually just what should pass for justice and what should be called injustice. Dissent is rooted in a concern for justice and justice is liberty, fairness for all people in a society, in our case, in the United States by the terms of a properly interpreted constitution. All literature has to be properly interpreted and brought up to date. There's a place where Justice Ginsburg describes what the Second Amendment uh, was all about in terms of the use of guns in society. It's very telling and very different than the way the NRA approaches it today. In any case, back to this principle here, dissent is rooted in a concern for justice. If you're a status quo person and you just go along with whoever happens to be in charge at the moment, even if uh, it's through a stolen election, um, then you don't have any concern for what's going on to, to the people who are treated unfairly by the people who are in um, formal power at the moment, because your concept of justice is whatever the power people permit those who are not in power. That sounds nothing like democracy, does it? If it does, then your definition of democracy and my definition of democracy are worlds apart. Dissent is rooted in a concern for justice. If you are not concerned for justice for all people, for yourself included, then you will never dissent. You will just be a case of rasa ra person. Go with the flow. No. That is not, that is not reflective of any kind of concern for justice. Bottom line, people who are concerned for justice probably cannot get through their adult lives without dissenting on a number of occasions. Dissent, when it is verbalized, and I'll say more about that in a moment, when it is verbalized, it is uttered in the language of a minority. Now, the person dissenting may be in a minority for a moment because of a difference of opinion with the group of people with whom she or he is speaking, or it may be something much more uh, widespread, such as racism. When people of color and those, those who are not of the racial minority, but who support them, speak up, um, there's still a minority 
even if you're not in the racial minority speaking against racism. So again, dissent, when it is verbalized, is uttered in the language of a minority. If you're in the majority and you're happy with the way things are going, uh, and many times that is the case, it seems lately that most of the time that is the case, then there's very little reason to dissent. Uh, to, to a large extent, because if you're in a power position, you have a means to try to bring about the needed change. Um, you're not left with needing to utter dissent. Often, people who dissent have no other tools at their disposal. All they can do is speak their dissent or act out their dissent. And that brings me to my next point. Dissent may be acted out rather than or in addition to being spoken. There are people who don't know how to speak their dissent or who, who are afraid to speak their dissent per se, but they will take dissenting actions, peaceful protests, for example. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr was a master of leading nonviolent protests. He had been influenced by Gandhi, uh, particularly during his doctoral studies at Boston School of Theology. <clears throat> nonviolent protest is an acted out form of dissent. You're not listening to what I'm saying, so I'm going to act in a way that I think reflects what ought to be done. A person of color going into a Woolworths lunch counter where black people are not permitted to sit and sitting there anyway. Rosa Parks sitting at the front of the bus rather than at the back of the bus. That is dissent without anything having been spoken. And in some respects, it becomes more, more powerful. It's not always more powerful, but in some respects, it can be more, more powerful. If you are familiar with the sayings of Jesus, where he said a couple of things that sort of are shocking. Uh, well, lots of things that he said are shocking, but these two in particular I have in mind. If somebody strikes you on one cheek, offer them the other. And you and lots of his original hearers were like, sure thing, right. If somebody asks you to walk one kilometer, walk two, carry their pack for them a second kilometer. Somebody asks for your outer garment, give them your undergarment too. Well, these aren't acts of generosity. These are acts of dissent in the culture. They were acts of dissent. Roman soldiers could backhand Jewish and other uh, people uh, that Rome held in subservience. If they didn't obey, they would backhand them. Um, and then if they didn't get out of the way, they offered them the other cheek, then they would come back at them with a fist or an open hand. And when that happened, Culturally, that equalized them. 
not in the mind of the Roman soldier, but in the mind of the culture. You take on an equal enemy with a fist or an open hand, not with a backhand. You backhand someone who is subservient to you. So when Jesus said, turn the other cheek, uh, if the Roman soldier takes the bait and hits you with an open hand or a fist, you are symbolically putting yourself on equal status as a human being, which the culture did not do. Roman soldiers could command Jews and other people in subservience to the Roman Empire to carry their back backpack for them because they're tired. They could command them to carry their backpack a kilometer or some measure of distance. Um, and Jesus said, if that happens, go to, because officially Rome had standards by which the, uh, the, the, the Roman police forces, the military police forces who watched after the people in subservience to Rome, um, they, Rome could not, the, the Roman military could not abuse people. That was not the standard by which the mighty Roman Empire ruled. Uh, the people had to fall in line in many respects, pay taxes, worship the emperor and so forth. But the, 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 the mighty Roman Empire, at least during Jesus' day, was not abusive to, um, to the people held in subservience. So, yeah, you could tell a Jewish person to carry your backpack for you, a heavy backpack for you, um, a kilometer. But no more. So Jesus said, if that happens to you, go the second kilometer. That is not <laughs> being <laughs> like the equivalent of a good Samaritan or something to that effect. Um, that's getting the Roman soldier in trouble. Somebody reports you went beyond what was required. And that gets the Rome, that's, that's dissent. That gets the Roman soldier in potentially hot water. So again, some acts of dissent are as powerful and maybe even more powerful than speaking dissent. That isn't always the case. Um, the pen can be mightier than the sword um, and the speech can be mightier than the sword. But sometimes an act of dissent also is very powerful. Though the status quo and the power people don't agree with this, the fact of the matter is honest dissent is not destructive. Honest dissent is not going to a, um, a rally of some sort uh, or a peaceful protest and doing all sorts of damage to people's property when you're there or attacking uh, the people who are against you and trying to stand stand you down at that at that protest. Dissent is not destructive. Dissent is peaceful, calm, um, matter of fact, straightforward. Um, it can draw all sorts of destructive responses from the people whose values and power you threaten when you speak your dissent or act your dissent. But dissent in and of itself is not destructive in terms of hurting people or damaging property. It is upsetting to people who want to live by a different set of values and pretend that the abuse they are heaping upon minority populations is okay. But dissent doesn't hurt people physically or damage their property. Needless to say, dissent is often risky. Power people are very frequently um, paranoid, uneasy about their power base. 
even dictators can be overtaken by enemies. And so if you're going to speak a word of dissent or act out some kind of dissent that challenges the person in power, that's a risk. And there could be some sort of retaliation from a verbal dress down to some sort of attempted humiliation to uh, text badgering uh, through social media and that sort of thing. But we owe a great deal <laughs> those of us who appreciate, recognize, and appreciate the true goodness that has evolved in this culture despite many failings, we owe everything, really, to dissenters who were willing to take the risks and speak truth to power. Just to be clear, even in what is now passing for democracy in the United States, there is often a price to be paid for dissenting. There should be no price to be paid at all for dissenting in the United States. Free speech, democracy should go hand in hand. But that often is not the case. So even in, in the democracy, even our democracy, there's often a price, sometimes a heavy price, sometimes the losing of one's life, a price to be paid for dissenting. It would be rare indeed to find a dissenter who was not, who is not courageous for the very reasons I've just described. Those who are willing to stand up and speak truth to power are courageous people. They put their reputations on the line. Sometimes they put their lives on the line. Sometimes Someone who speaks truth to power has her or his family threatened. In one of Justice Ginsburg's quotes that you have heard or will hear before our online gathering ends today, she said, not in these words, but she said, dissenters are the true optimists. The dissenters are the people who really believe in the future. What you say now may get nowhere. But also what you say now isn't going to go away. This also is a concept that grows out of Hebrew culture and tradition, going back to the ancient times of, he, of the times that the Hebrew scripture was being written. Words had power. Uh, in the age of Twitter storms and nonsense like that, words have lost their power. Uh, except to entertain and attract attention. But growing out of Hebrew tradition, growing out of Jewish tradition, words had power. So 
you speak a word of dissent at this moment and it gets you nowhere at this moment, but it lives on. What you have spoken lives on. It outlives you, passes along to the next generation, let's say. Somebody keeps it alive. Think about how little Ruth Bader Ginsburg's fellow Jew, Jesus of Nazareth. Think about how little his words were put into practice right when he uttered them. And what a minuscule chance there was that people like us would even know what he said. But that little bit of what he said, and many of you have heard me say many times, at most we can piece together references to 30 days out of a out of a lifetime of, that lasted 30 years. Not whole days, parts of days. <laughs> limited, limited teachings. Wow. And those teachings have changed the world time and again. So dissenters are optimists. Ruth Bader Ginsburg put up with a whole lot of um, resistance in her lifetime, in her tenure on the Supreme Court. And even in her latter years, during this particular presidential administration and the current Senate, uh, such verbal abuse And yet, with all the illness that she had, she continued to stand her ground. And her dying wish, quoted to her granddaughter, as I understand it, was a fervent desire that her spot not be filled until the presidential election was over. And the Republicans in leadership are doing everything they can to make sure that her wish is not honored. But someday that wish of hers might turn into something that perhaps now it won't turn into. Talk about a pioneer. Talk about somebody who laid the groundwork for us, who went ahead of us and chopped down the bush through the jungle so that we could follow a path. She dissented. Now we dissent. We follow her amazing example if we are courageous enough to do so. Promoting active liberty does not mean allowing the majority to run roughshod over minorities. It calls for taking special care that all groups have a chance to fully participate in society and the political process.